Well, it's a very great honour to be presenting to you all, and thanks to the Royal Societies of Australia for this great opportunity. I'm going to be unashamedly very Western-focused in this presentation, um, which is going to talk about Western Australia and particularly the Southwest Biodiversity Hotspot as a real indication of where we are going nationally and the issues that we face on the continent, with Western Australia being essentially one of the key global instances of where we need to manage our landscapes. Now, I'm speaking to you from um, a property that I purchased five years ago. You can probably hear the uh, endangered red tail forest cockatoos in the background. And um, so I'm very uh, uh, honoured to have this piece of land, uh, which most of it's under a conservation covenant. So I'm actually living my belief in the future of Australia. So what do we have in Australia? We're a place of the extraordinary. This image, which comes from a year ago up in the Kimberley of Western Australia, shows um, one of our co-workers north of Fitzroy River collecting water lilies. And they sent this photo saying, wow, isn't this amazing? Well, it was more amazing than we thought. Although we could identify some of the species, the very large white one that you can see just here turned out to be something that I didn't know. And we work on uh, the Nymphaeas, the water lilies of Australia, sent it to Q's specialist who we work with, Carlos Magdalena. And last year he said, my God, that is a new water lily. And given the scale, it's potentially the world's largest water lily. So we're hoping to go back now uh, that the rains have eased off to look at those species. But we all know that Australia keeps yielding astonishing species. Here's a map of the hotspots of the world, uh, all 36 of them. The red areas indicate whether there is uh, great stress and the size of those red areas shows that those hotspots are associated with growing and developing city centres. The southwest of Western Australia is unique in so many ways, isolated essentially like a Galapagos island for at least the last 16 million years. It's developed in splendid isolation on ancient infertile soils without genetic input from overseas and interstate in recent geological time, and hence has developed a whole raft of species. Here's some of those. This is six slash seven of the endemic families. To put that into context, Europe has no endemic families. UK has none. In fact, they struggle to have an endemic genus. But Western Australia has a lot of these. And although many of these will be unfamiliar to you, some might be if you're a carnivorous plant person, see the Albany pitcher plant sitting to one side. The plant in the bottom right-hand side, many of you won't know that, but a few years back that became a global sensation when it was found to be the most ancient ancestor of something we eat every day, which is the cereals. But let's concentrate on the one on the far left, the Dasypoganaceae. And what we've got there is an image of this plant. This is Kingia australis. I grew up as a kid in these landscapes, thought this was the most wonderful plant. We thought it was direct first cousin to the grass tree, but gosh, we couldn't have been more wrong. Once the molecular people had their way, we suddenly discovered this was not just any grass tree. This, in fact, was totally unrelated, and it was in not only its own family, but it's one of the only places on earth where a plant has its own endemic order. And Kingia australis beds back as a lineage in the Dasypogonales to around 125 million years, within 10 to 15 million years of the dawn of the flowering plants, still living on these landscapes and still doing the things that it's done so magnificently. So, of course, it was a place developing in the most splendid isolation. And in 1697, William de Vlaming came to the West Coast, sailed up the Swan River, collected a range of different plants, uh, was bemused by the place. They travelled, of course, in summer, which was a very hot and difficult time of the year, thought it was an inhospitable place and promptly left. This didn't stop people like Linnaeus starting to describe some of the early collections that were coming out of the country post-British settlement on the East Coast. And a series of people all the way up to Ferdinand von Mueller, of course, the probably one of the most prolific botanists in Australian history who published widely. And what this plot, which is uh, courtesy of Kevin Teeley and Steve Hopper, shows something that is a phenomenon and helps us explain where we've got to. What we essentially have is from 1895, we get a decline in the pace of botanical discovery. And in fact, 
what was happening was people were losing interest. It was thought that we knew everything. By the time I went to university in 1972 around here, there were about 3,800 species in Western Australia. We are now in nothing less than a renaissance of Australian and Western Australian botanical discovery. We're now for the southwest corner of 8,600 species, and that keeps growing. Even in my own backyard, in the property where I'm sitting, these were two new orchid discoveries within eyeshot of where I'm sitting of two new fairy orchids, both mimicking native species growing on a couple of isolated bauxitic plateaus about an hour south of Perth, Caledonia lateritica in the top left and Caledonia rosea on the bottom right. Related to common orchid, but these ones are delightfully different colours and also with a heady fragrance scent. Equally, we've just described Australia's newest underground orchid, species in the top left, Rhizanthella johnstonii, growing on the south coast. We once thought that the central and southern underground orchids that you can see here in the centre of the picture, these leafless, rootless, greenless plants, the complete contradiction of anything that you'd normally expect, we thought they were one species. The molecular evidence now shows that they are two. And again, this is all work in the last two to three years. What we're also finding is that the west coast of Australia has been a cradle of all sorts of evolutionary donations to elsewhere. Here we see some recent work that's come out of uh, ANU and uh, the National Botanic Gardens, which shows for the sun orchids of Australia, the most glorious and beguiling of all. Down here we have, of course, the fabled Queen of Sheba orchid. But when that's been put onto a molecular clock, we essentially show the green areas shown here with the Ws indicates that Western Australia is in fact the ancestral home and that by the donation of seed over long periods of tens of millions of years, they not only developed species in Eastern Australia, they went offshore to New Zealand and New Caledonia. Equally, when we look at the things that are driving that diversification, we need no look no further than many of the orchids. Here is pollination of Drake elastica, an extraordinary genus of orchids, 10 species, one extinct, all using sexual deception of these remarkable plants to promote speciation. This is thinned wasps. You can see them with their little numbered tags where we do capture and release studies to look at how local the movement of pollen is in this orchid. And so enticing is the scent from this orchid that it's able to attract multiple males. Now, this is not exclusive to uh, just these orchids. As we've discovered, the, sonar, the um, particular molecules that they have are unique to the dracheas produced by special glands. Uh, they're called pyrazines, and that we find similar molecules in many other species, while others, such as spider orchids we see here and beard orchids, use other classes of molecules. We have more sexual luring of orchids in Australia and more in Western Australia than almost all the world combined. Equally, when we scratch a little below the surface, we find not only is pollination driving diversification, but adaptations to the stringencies of our environment. This is a little plot of land, 50 centimetres by 50 centimetres. You can see a boot for scale there. Following a summer bushfire, this is in November, following a December fire north of Perth. This is the hyper-diverse, highly infertile area. And what we've got coming up after the fire are a whole range of seeds. In fact, there's 65 seedlings in that area from 23 species and 11 families. Many of those are species that we could never germinate, things such as baronia, trigger plants, rushes and sedges, many of the native heaths. And what we discovered after work, pioneering work by South African botanists, is that in the Australian bushland, typified by fires in Western Australia and Southeastern Australia and elsewhere, Fire equals smoke equals a particular stimulus. And so we've worked on this particular area and discovered that in the surface of the soils of these areas, what we have is a particular chemical. Here we've got contact adhesive. We've put some blotting paper. This is some smoke responsive seed put on the top and we can get this so-called chemical coming up through the contact sticky adhesive. What we've now discovered is uh, and published this uh, in 2004 
was this molecule. It's a butenolide, and it's in its own particular class now called carotenolides from the Noongar word karik for smoke. And this molecule is absolutely irresistible for the germination of many Australian and overseas plants. So our bushland species have used a whole range of tricks of the trade to survive and no doubt evolve. But it's interesting, as we went along on that journey, we did find that although we thought carotenoids were important, even in our state floral emblem, the red and green kangaroo paw, we discovered this species, which didn't respond to the carotenoid, responded to another very unusual molecule, cyanohydrins, which liberates cyanide. And in fact, it's the world's first cyanide-promoted plant development in germination ever discovered. We've been able to take that discovery for a whole range of species and develop effective large-scale propagation techniques, which have then led to the development of everything from smoke water to little parcels that we've sent off to schools with, uh, you can see a gelatin capsule with seed. They soak them in the smoke water, put them in their little packet, and we can teach Australian kids about the extraordinary development of our flora using these smoke cues. But of course, there's a flip side. Darwin predicted this in his voyage to Australia. He, of course, got the species wrong. Both the emu and kangaroo did not become scarce. They became very widespread and common through the introduction of artificial forage and artificial water. But what he didn't realise is that many other plants and animals were certainly going to be in great trouble. And I've come up with this statement that essentially 65 million years since the Gondwanan breakup, the southwest of Western Australia has been 200 years in declining since European contact. What does that look like? This is the southwest corner of Western Australia. All the light areas indicate extensive clearing for agriculture, urban development and mining and forestry. Essentially, if we put that on the scale of the UK, in 200 years, we put over large scale clearing on a scale unparalleled and for which species had limited capacity. Here, for example, if we just overlay in those purple dots, the critically endangered species is 109 plant species critically endangered, most of those as a result of excessive clearing. Equally, we can see even common systems such as Bankshire woodland that you see here, now so extensively cleared that just three years ago they were listed as a nationally threatened ecosystem. And this was a system that I developed in as a kid that I thought was inexhaustible. So essentially what we did is what Britain took a thousand years to do was we took vast areas of landscapes and converted them very rapidly, not allowing time for any adaptive capabilities. Equally, today, this is from 1987 to the present, in the Darling Escarpment, we continue to impose extraordinary impacts on the landscape. What you see here is clearing by the multinational mining company Alcoa Illumina. It shows them going through the landscapes at seven square kilometres a year. Essentially, what that looks like is large-scale clearing as of 2020. We can look at that in a cumulative plot here, which shows the size of the footprint, both in the northern and southern operations. This is just one company. There are others that operate. And you can see the size of that footprint is growing with no end in sight through the state agreement acts that operate. What does this mean? It means that those footprints are essentially greater than the size of London that have been cleared in that short period of time. For many animals and plants, this means extraordinary impacts. These are logs being taken out from those areas prior to the seven square kilometres, which have a direct impact on so many habitats, both for hollow-bearing, nesting birds, forage species, and for the future ecological stability of the environment. Importantly, throughout the southwest, Western Australia has now imposed other impacts with very little ecological care and consideration. Prescribed burning, for example, this 2020 image from the Stirling Range National Park of a back burning operation on a colossal scale. Now, where they do aerial incendiaries and grid the area until they produce a pyrocumulus, have, we believe, important impacts that now need to be understood. Otherwise, we approach tipping points. Equally, even the botanical sensation of the century. There's an image of me from the, the late 70s working on this plant we found 180 in 1982. By 2020, we were down, we suspect, just one plant. For us, at least 2,000 species in the southwest now have nil or insufficient habitat to support viable populations. 
Sometimes the intricate ecologies, as we've seen for the hammer orchids, where the male wasp needs to have females that live on underground scarab beetle larvae. The orchid itself, as you'll see on the right, has a particular mycorrhizal fungus. The complex webs that occur mean that we break these systems and we have to put back multiple elements. For the underground orchid, we now know the particular mycorrhizal partner, the particular pollinating agents, the dispersal agents of these strange, sweet capsules that are produced underground are all vanishing from many of the habitats where this orchid occurs. Rebuilding these orchids, rebuilding much of the landscapes is about building intricate associations. Now, unlike Europe, where if we take this Bavarian grassland, you leave it, do nothing else. From 1975 to 1982, it converts from grassland. So the first shrubs to 2006, you will get woodland. We've done the same in Western Australia for an area cleared in World War II in the wheat belt of Western Australia, you see here. You can go back today, there is no migration. Although we have a dire extinction crisis looming in the southwest of West Australia, it is the community and the people of Western Australia that are now seeing that we need change. Gondwana Link, one of the greatest and largest reconnections of fragmented landscapes on Earth, a thousand kilometres of buying back farmland and rebuilding it through restoration ecology, is happening as we speak. Importantly, even if we look at some of the work that we do at Curtin and with other colleagues, we've now developed for many of our orchid species ways to grow them with their mycorrhizal fungi and now are looking for habitats to put these particular orchids back into their safe locations. Importantly, technology, just as farmers are able to sow large areas each year to seed, we're now developing effective seed-based technologies that mean instead of going to small machinery, we can put them through a canola seeder. For example, we're now developing pelleting technology that takes seed and put in it all sorts of compounds to mean every seed is a winner, which includes the carotenolide molecule, anti-stress agents and biologicals. Equally, we're sharing this new journey and this new hope for the Southwest and for Australia with our Indigenous First Nation people this is our first Indigenous owned and run native seed farm in the southwest of Western Australia. Exciting times with an exciting future ahead. And I'll just to conclude with this image from a colleague. This is Stephen Tinge, a square kilometre array up in Murchison, where they just scanned 10 million stars to find that we are certainly very much alone. There were no techno signatures in that area. But let's hope our future together. We are not alone, but we share them with the animals and plants that give us, Australians, our identity. Thank you very much.